Yes. Yeah. I was just curious if you kept up with any of those other secretaries that you were. I did. I did just to see where they were living and what they were doing. But then I failed to, and not a one of us ever told each other what we did. And, and I regret that because uh, I realize now that they were doing top secret too. Uh, one, one girl, uh, it was a uh, daughter of one of them said that uh, her mother wasn't in our group, but she was a nurse that was working when D-Day and the terrific number of uh, soldiers came in on those troop ships, you know, uh, hospital ships. And I think that must have been a very rough time. And I spoke to another girl whose mother was over there doing top secret work when she was decoding the German messages coming over. So you see, there were women like us that were over there doing our part too. Yes, you'll have to talk loud so I can hear. No, no. I knew the equipment was there, but it all depended on the weather. We the, for three days they would say, "I wonder if this will be the day." And they said, "No, the weather is still cloudy crossing the channel. They can't. They don't have a good division of it." So, the morning that the sun came out, uh, that was the first. I was eating breakfast when. Churchill came on the radio and said today was a D-Day. So that was the first that any of us knew when it was. <laughs> when you were standing in the room and the Queen King walked in, um, did you say that their daughter ended up driving y'all to the embassy or something? Or uh, when the King and Queen walked into the room, were you looking at the paintings? You're talking about the Queen? Yes. Did, you, did, she ever, did you ever get to meet her after that again? I, I didn't realize that, that they were, that those girls were, well, I knew who they were because uh, they were very prominent in the newspapers. But uh, I was very surprised that I was able to even meet them, let alone the king and queen. Does that answer your question? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I thought it was a great honor. Yes. Didn't, didn't what? Did the plans ever mention how it was decided who was going to land first? How they decided who was going to send? I don't know. Uh, I'm sure that these men had an opportunity to look at the number of, of us girls that were coming over. They, they were the ones that selected me. Uh, and, and because we all were doing top secret, nobody ever mentioned what the other one was doing. So they could have had a part of something else just as much. We, uh, I, so many students say, how fast did you type? It wasn't how fast, it was how accurate so that I didn't have to erase because it was on carbon paper. Uh, I know I typed slow, but I typed accurate so that I wouldn't have to. Uh, Evidently, I'd, and, and I still don't know how they duplicated the, the typing because we didn't have a duplicating machine at that time. Uh, and, and yet, um, the paper that, uh, the book that I took up to the general, that was, I don't think it was my typing. I think it was more of a printed. So it might have been sent to a printing company to do but I never ask questions. Did you ever get emotional while typing? Like, considering the fact that you couldn't talk to anyone, you just hold it in your side, did you ever like, get emotional while you did exercising? I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I do have a hearing problem. Did Let you me. get emotional as you were typing? Yeah, my typing. Did you ever get emotional 
while you were typing oh. without what you were typing? No, because I never read it. See, I, I trained my mind not to know what I typed. So at the end of the day, I couldn't remember anything that I typed. And that was the secret of, of training with the FBI. It's, it's amazing what you can do if you have to. So have you gone back and read the plans that you typed? Have you read them since then? I've read them once. I've read that. There's about 20 some pages. Were you surprised by anything? You no, because then it was coming back to me uh, that I was amazed at the, the uh, volume of equipment that had to be stored. And, uh, and then after, when I read real history, read the history books of some of the generals who were there, and they told how they had to get the equipment from the, uh, the uh, French coast to them in, in their, as they were going through France and Germany. That taken a lot of logistics to do it. It's amazing how the war was won, <laughs> really. I remember right after D-Day, the Stars and Stripes came up every day, so that's where we got our information. And, um, <clears throat> and it would say, um, uh, General, uh, probably some of our generals weren't crossing into Germany far enough as they were supposed to. And they were wondering why, uh, like Bradley, why his group hadn't gone further than he did. But it was probably because he ran into a lot of, of uh, comp opposition and they couldn't get through. Uh, but that, that's what we watched the most was where was our army where the generals were, how far did they get into England or France? Did they meet their objective? If they didn't, why? What, what would they run against? And it was, the, of course, the German opposition. But uh, it, it, it taught us how the war was won by, by watching it day by day. But these are things that I can talk to the senior group in school or military. I speak to a lot of military people who have, they're not World War II veterans, but they're Army veterans. And they're always asking questions of that type that I can answer the best of my ability anyway. Yes? No, I think it was me. Um, I, I was so sure that if I told anybody what I did, the FBI would hear it and pick me up and put me in jail. <laughs> That's how scared I was about it. And even, even when Noel and I were dating in London, and I was, and, and I was uh, you know, visiting, we were talking, I still never, he never knew who I was working for. But... You know, that's, that was our job, and uh, we did it the best that we could. Yes? Before, the, you, before, your speech, before your speech, you were telling me that you got to hear Glenn Miller's band, the Army Air Corps band. Um, a lot of the veterans that I've spoke to about that have gotten to see his band in 44 and 45, they said that, you know, when they started playing, like, all of a sudden it... Uh, it was as if the war wasn't going on because they were playing so well. Was that true when you got to hear Miller's band? They didn't know the war was going on? Well, it, it lifted their spirits. Oh, lift. <coughs> yes, we, we watched very closely when there was a good... We worried ourselves sick on the Battle of the Bulge. That was the worst one that I can remember. Every morning we were praying that the fog would lift so that somebody could get in there and save those men. And uh, I was pl glad to know that it was my brother who was with General Patton who was in there and rescued some of those people. But uh, yeah, we watched it very closely. 
on, uh, with our uh, Stars and Stripe magazine that was quite, and you know, my, I, at the end of a week, I sent my Stars and Stripes home to my folks so they could keep up with them. And when I got married, they gave them back to me and I had them up in the attic until I had started speaking to schools. So I took these Stars and Stripes and I started out with the one of uh, Pearl Harbor, which was an American magazine. And then the rest of them were all Stars and Stripes. And I had it cataloged all the way to the end of the war. And it was everyone that told the complete history of the war. Well, at that time, the River of Fayetteville schools were having students do research and interview people. So this young boy came to my house and he said he was supposed to interview me about World War II. And I said, okay, tell me about it. He said, I don't know anything about it. I said, you don't even know why it started? He said, no. I said, well, how are you going to write an essay on it? And he said, I don't know. So I said, I'll tell you what, I'll let you have my stars and stripes if you return them. And he never returned them. And I put articles in the newspaper the young man who borrowed my stars and stripes, would he please return them? But nobody. And you know, it couldn't be something that you would throw away because it was about this big a package, about like this, you know, because I did it, it was all laminated. And somebody's got it and they've got a, something very rare because, uh, but it'll come back some, day, some way. When the war was over, they notified us that we would be sh uh, marching down Champs Elysees. So they told us to uh, press our pants, polish our shoes, that we would be marching down Champs Elysees. It was about a eight hour parade because every country had to have all of their soldiers and their equipment go down. The so. We, we were probably in the middle of it, so as soon as we passed the, the uh, reviewing stand, those girls jumped out so that we could watch the rest of the parade. But then they said they would turn the lights on in Paris that night. So we got up on top of our hotel and we watched the lights come on in Paris. And they started out with uh, Eiffel Tower lights came on. And then the, uh, the uh, the uh, Champs Elysees lights came on all the way down from one end to the other. And then the, the church, the Momart church out on the north side of town came on. That I think was the first feeling that we had that the war was over and that we'd be coming home. But I have a picture of me marching down Champs Elysees. So there's some, some good pictures that I've got that I cherish very much. Thank you.